Why, hello there, and welcome. <laughs> you are now listening to The Creep of Despair with your hostess with the mostess, Cosmic Eve. What are you doing here? This is Mark Shelton from Vanilla Road in Hellwell, and you're listening to The Crypt of Despair. And I've got long hair. Hello friends, welcome back to the Crypt of Despair. It's Cosmic Eve here with you today, and we are talking with Mark Shelton from Manila Road, and also Hellwell. We will be talking all about the weird, strange sounds coming out of Mirgod Sound Labs. So stay sitting tight and get ready for a Halloween edition of the Crypt of Despair. So, to get started, first I'll set the atmosphere. We're probably um, somewhere near a graveyard. The moon is out. Clouds are making it look sort of iridescent in the skies. It's got to be foggy. Definitely foggy. So, I imagine we're in some cobblestone alleyway. You're wearing the Jack the Ripper coat, and uh, we're going to trade off some uh, alchemy potions. (laughs) All right. (laughs) <laughs> Alrighty, so to get started, first off, tell me about how well, what's new? Any music in the works? Absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, we just finished, uh, I just finished mixing the new album. And yeah, I've, I've got some treats to talk about on this. It, it's, in my mind, it's even heavier than uh, uh, the first one, but it's... Uh, it's also maybe a little more progressive in some some ways. Uh, we've got a new drummer for the band, uh, Thumper, our previous drummer. He is actually uh, becoming quite a uh, reputed uh, uh, glassblower out in uh, the Eugene, Oregon area. And he just didn't have time to take away from his new budding career. Art, art there's... There's a pun for you. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, <clears throat> you know, he makes great pipes and stuff, and he's just really artistic with it. And he's uh, acquiring quite a bit of fame, and I'm sure a decent amount of wealth of doing this too, and he's really good at it. And he just didn't have time to uh, come back to Kansas and uh, spend you know, a month or so working in the studio to get the, the album done. So uh, I went to of my file cabinet in my head and said, who can I call? And uh, lo and behold, I just ended up with uh, Randy Thrasher Fox again on the album. So nice. we've, we've reunited, so to speak. Uh, he did a show with Manila Road in Greece uh, a while back, and uh, it was uh, it was pretty cool. And uh, he was available to work on the album, and uh, we just finished uh, the recording of it not too long ago. And I've been in the studio for the last month or so mixing on it, and uh, got it all finished now. And uh, the only thing left to do is to take it to another studio to master, and uh, and of course I need to swing a deal on it. But uh, <clears throat> I think that's probably going to be pretty easy to do at this point. Uh, uh, most likely uh, will be out this year, and uh, it's definitely in the vein of of hell. Well, no happy endings, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Do everybody would be dies. doomed. Everybody dies. No, we picked some cool subjects this time. We uh, 
took on the first Outer Limits episode uh, with a song called Galaxy Being. And uh, uh, let's see, we uh, took on the the uh, Cannibal of Zybrick, uh Carl Donka, which I don't think he's very well written about. So uh, might be an interest to people that love following, you know, cases like the Ripper and Ed Gein and stuff like that, because this guy was definitely, you know, one of my favorites, actually. Because <laughs> <laughs> nice. yeah, he, he wasn't just, uh, he wasn't just, you know, cannibalizing people. He was actually uh, using everything that he could find in the body to, to make something with it. it was during the days of Prussia after World War One, And everybody was really, <clears throat> really poor back then very small community uh, that uh, I think is only like 8,000 people but all the vagrants that came wandering through he'd offer them a place to stay and then he'd kill them and uh, use everything of their body to make stuff with like he'd mash their bones and make uh, soap out of them mm-hmm. made shoes out of human hair made uh belts and suspenders out of human skin and stuff like that and of course he ate a lot of it but the coolest part was that uh uh he would actually uh he he was actually uh, uh, the organ player or the organ grinder i think as they called him at that point mm-hmm. uh you know at the church at the local church he was highly respected and carried the cross at funerals and stuff and and people in the community, even though he wasn't a minister, uh, they called him Father Donka. And so he was highly respected and well-known. And he would sell his wares at the Market Square in the center of town, you know. So he was selling people all this stuff he made out of human bodies. And not only that, but he sold what he called pickled pork in jars. But it was actually pickled human. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, he finally got found out. And he strung himself up by his own necktie in his cell before anybody got a confession out of him or anything. So there was no memoir or anything. So it's sort of like nobody knows why he was doing it or anything. But, you know, he must have had some morality. He didn't uh, he didn't munch on little girls or women. It was only male vagrants. So, and it wasn't people from the community either. So he had some sort of sense of honor. <laughs> <laughs> I applaud his sense of honor. No, we've taken on some pretty uh, brutal stuff on this one. And uh, um, also uh, took on a story that uh, EC wrote called uh, The Last Rites of Edward Hawthorne and uh, made a big, like, I don't know, 14 minute epic out of it. And uh, the dock of things, even longer, I think it's like 16 minutes. And. Uh, uh, so, you know, I'm really proud of this. It sounds really good. Randy's drumming on it is just incredibly cool, incredibly imaginative and cool. And I think that's what's given this project a little bit more of a progressive feel than the first one. The first one, you know, Thumper's more of a thrash drummer. So we had more of a consistent drive going on everything on the first album. And this one is more like... You know, uh, really here and there. I mean, lots of intricate drum parts. And, and then sometimes some stuff where he lays back and just finds the pocket where you might expect him not to. But uh, he thoroughly surprised me, just like he always did on the old albums he did with Manila Road. And it's just been really cool to work with him again. And uh, it's been fun. And so I'm looking forward to it. To coming out because I think it's an extremely great follow up to our first album. Awesome. So there. <laughs> that was a great end to. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to know how Hellwell formed during your spare time and dedicating your efforts to Manila Road. Well, actually, uh, I guess I'd say Hellwell sort of uh, happened because of several sort of mishaps that were going on with the band at the time. Well, Manila Road, that is. <clears throat> at that moment, uh, uh, Corey Christner was our drummer, and uh, Vince Coleman was our bass player. And the first thing that happened as a mishap was that Vince 
uh, uh, ended up acquiring what they call Meniere's disease. And I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a, it's an affliction that uh, centers on your equilibrium and your inner eardrum. And uh, it seems to be really comp complicated by loud noises. And of course, being in a heavy metal band and having that kind of problem doesn't really go together very well. And so he was having troubles on tour with us just because of that. And then he started developing some carpal tunnel problems with one of his hands. And he was he was in a lot of pain and he was really sick. And he basically uh, had only finished two songs on uh, the Playground of the Damned album. And then told me that he just couldn't do it anymore, that he had to, he had to call it quits. And so I was sort of in one of those situations where I had to go through my file cabinet and my brain again and figure out who the hell I could, uh, you know, call up. And uh, Ernie came to mind. That was the only option I had at, at the moment. And uh, I had him come in and uh, do the bass parts on the rest of the album for Manila Road's Playground of the Damned album. And it turned out really quick. And while we were doing all of that, that's when... Uh, our, uh, our second engineer, Dr. Doom, Derek uh, Brubaker, uh, uh, we were just all joking around and somehow or another we, we had said something about how we thought that uh, Ernie's last name would make a great name for, uh, for a band, you know. And I, I think it came out of me saying that something about Manila Road just never was the type of name that it says what the band's about. It doesn't say heavy. It doesn't say epic doom or metal or anything like that. It doesn't say metal. And so, you know, I, I think I was complaining that that I hadn't picked a very very good name, but it was strange how whenever I tried to change the name, nobody, had, none of the labels would let me do it. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, uh, and even when I had done, you know, offshoot projects like Circus Maximus, it still got turned into a Manila Road album. So I think I was just being sort of down on this situation at the time because I could never get away with doing anything that wasn't Manila Road and or called Manila Road, even if it wasn't Manila Road. And uh, uh, somehow we came up with this idea of doing this just super, super heavy and only you know, only uh, really in-your-face type uh, lyric content, you know, and really really on the evil side, you know, like the to the alpha in a sense. And, and uh, uh, I just really wanted to be able to just cut loose and do some really, you know, bizarre lyric content and stuff that really wasn't very nice, you know, or, uh, you know, <laughs> condensing good moral behavior or whatever <laughs> <laughs> and uh and so that's i that's how it all got started it was because you know we were in a in sort of a pickle with uh uh the manila road project and he you know having ernie do the tracks on that sort of saved us on that album and then right after we finished the album we ended up with uh cory getting in, in trouble legally and not being able to tour and so uh, that's when we ended up with Noidy, and uh, during all of that time where there was a little bit of nothing going on, uh, I had time to work on the Hellwell Project, the first one beyond the, the boundaries of sin. And uh, so, you know, we just sort of hammered that one out, and we were lucky enough to have Thumper around, um, you know, to contribute his uh, his talent to the drums. And uh that was a really fun project to work on too. It was really great working with Thumper and uh, Johnny Benson is his real name. I guess I ought to throw his real name out there. We always have nicknames for everybody. And, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, that, that's sort of how it all got started. You know, we, uh, uh, Thumper and us running into each other was sort of just haphazard also because uh, uh, I sort of met him through another friend that, uh, I had worked with at some point at one of my jobs and, uh, um, you know, he, uh, he, I was mentioning that, you know, Hey, yeah, I was, I was looking for a really good drummer. He says, Oh, Hey, I know one. And he goes, who? And <laughs> took me over there. We partied. And, uh, next thing I know, I was, well, Hey, come over let's set up, you know, my drum set and see what you got, you know? 
found out he was left-handed, we had to re <laughs> rearrange the drum set completely. But uh, he turned out being really good, really cool, and uh, and very helpful at coming along with ideas. Uh, uh, he even, you know, uh, was a good guitar player, played guitar on one of the songs, and uh, helped write some of the material. And so it, it was fun. It was it was a really good offshoot project. And for the first time in my life, I'd actually been able to be a part of another band and not have any label try and call it Manila Road. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm, I'm happy for that. And now it's just turned into a thing. There was enough interest from the first album and enough people saying, well, hey, aren't you going to do another one? And that we decided, well, okay, I guess maybe we ought to try and put out another one. And uh, that's when, you know, once again, Thumper couldn't, you know, make it. So I ended up with Randy Fox. And it's just, it's been a really cool experience. And I think, uh, I think the sound of the band has just totally progressed into a really cool, even cooler new realm of heavy and intrica intricacy. And, uh, uh, I'm proud of it. I'm really proud of it. I can't wait until it comes out so I can see what everybody, you know, what are people love it or hate it. <laughs> awesome. But I, I, th I think I did some really great uh, doom-like and death metal-type vocal stuff on this. It's uh, pretty blood-curdling at times. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, that's like what it. we welcome here at the Crypt. Absolutely, because it sounds despairing. <laughs> 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 all right well, so tell me about ec hellwell i know he likes to hang out in the shadows you know if you ever play live like do you think you'll be able to get him out i don't know uh, that's pretty uh, that would be a near impossibility uh he just really doesn't like to be in the public anything i mean he loves to play music loves to write and he does a pretty good job at both. And uh, as a matter of fact, I tried to get him to be here for this, but unfortunately he's at a, a, a book signing party right now because the, the new Swords of Steel uh, Volume 2 just came out, and he's like, uh, he had the, the spotlight as being the, uh, oh, what do you call it? He had the top billing on the book, you know, and they used his, his story of uh, the Forgotten City of Tim is uh, the idea for the front cover art. And uh, so it just came out this week, and uh, he just got his, his copies. And I just, as a matter of fact, I've got a copy here in front of me right now. I was just checking it out. Of course, I'd already read the story because, you know, I'm around him a lot, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> well, send him my congratulations. Oh, thank you. I will. And, uh, but as far as playing live, you know, it, you know, EC is not the only problem there. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, um, he plays keyboards and bass, you know, in the group. And because we just have this as sort of like a studio project, it's easy for him to do that. So we, we'd actually have to figure out you know, we'd have to hire somebody else to come in. We'd have to find somebody else to come in and play either keyboards or, or bass, one or the other. And, of course, they'd have to be able to, you know, do the parts that Ernie does. And uh, and then we'd have the other problem of trying to get uh, Randy involved enough that we'd actually go out live and play because uh, uh, he's just, you know, he's got a life of his own. He's got a family. He's got kids. He's, you know perfectly fine with working on studio projects but uh touring is probably just not in the, the cards for him so uh it would be you know it'd be like i'm the only one that's out of the whole bunch of us that uh, has the availability to go out and tour constantly so and i've always said this that manila road is going to be my primary concern always so if it's a choice of having one band or the other, I'm probably going to stick with Manila Road no matter how you look at it, just because, you know, that's my, that's my brainchild, my, my, my baby from 1977, you know, you can't abandon your kids when you've had them that long. <laughs> 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 so I, I really don't think playing lives really in the, in, you know, even anywhere close to being in the works for, for LL. So, 
uh, just makes it that much more important for people to go out and buy the product. That way they can, you know, if they really want to see it live, you know, buy lots of albums so that we can make enough money to hire all the musicians that have to come along. And, and see, we never expected to do this in a live situation anyway. So there's places where I'm playing like multiple guitar parts and, and we might have to have, uh, you know, somebody come in like John Luca from Battle Ram or somebody like that come in and play rhythm guitar for us as well. And it, it'd be quite an undertaking to get all of that on the road, I think, at this point, especially with all the time I spend with um, Manila Road touring at this point. And we're going to be doing a lot of that this year. We've got tons of dates that we're doing in Europe this year. And uh, I think I'm going to be busy you know, most of the summer. That's why I was trying to get this Hallowell project all finished and uh, out my door in the studio so that I could, uh, you know, really uh, not have to worry about that when I'm on tour with the band. And uh, we also have a, a new Manila Road album that we were finishing recording on, too. As a matter of fact, I've got all my parts recorded. I'm just waiting on Josh and Brian to, to finish their parts. And uh, we've already got noisy drum parts all, all tracked and everything, and uh, so that's that's getting really close to being being done as well. And uh, I would expect it to come out maybe late this year, first part of next year, something like that. And uh, mm -hmm. as far as I know, Zix has uh, picked up our option on our, our contract, but uh, uh, nothing set on in stone. But as far as I know, we're still probably going to be signed to Zix and Germany Zix Music and Golden Core Records. So, uh, and as far as the Hellwell, uh, most likely it'll be on High Roller, I would expect, but uh, that that's also up in the air because I don't have a solid contract. But the last time I talked to the owner of High Roller Records, he told me he wanted the project, and since they did the first one, I'd probably give them first option on it anyway, just because they did such a great job. And have done a great job on all of our vinyl LP reissues that have, you know, come out through iRoll. Or they're really high quality uh, vinyl label, and probably the highest quality vinyl label that's out there. And um, so, you know, uh, always support that guy. And if he if he wants this project and you know offers me a good deal, then we'll probably have a deal pretty quick. That's exciting. Yay! <laughs> yeah, but, oh, Bring I, us I more like, to do. It's not all too upbeat and too, uh, too, you know, exciting because I know we're in the crypt of despair. So, uh, yeah, maybe I should talk we're about We're still that. very solemn about this. <laughs> <laughs> so, tell me about the keyboard influences or what sort what? of inspirations? Well, you know, Ernie and I seem to have an awful lot of the same inspirations and influences and in, in music, and most of it comes from way back when. I'd say, uh, you know, John Lord, Ken Hensley type stuff, Deep Purple, Uriah Heep, and uh, you know, I, I, I just always loved that that Hammond B3 type of organ sound and. And Ernie's really into these, you know, big pipe organ things. And I love that stuff, too, like, you know, Johann Sebastian Bach type stuff. And, and of course, uh, you know, through, I was a piano player first anyway. So I can really re relate to a lot of uh, what's going on. And it's easy to interact with him. And, you know, uh, even though we argue a lot, uh I think he still owes Johnny uh, 20 bucks, but, you know, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's highly influenced by, you know, the old, the old heavy space rock realm of, of, of keyboard styles. But I know there's some other influences there too, like Greg Rofera, who used to be in uh, the band uh, Angel and a really great, you know, keyboard and synthesis player. And, then uh, just all the really old, weird electronic wizards, you know, like Larry Fast, put out a whole bunch of albums by, under the name Synergy, uh, Tangerine Dream, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of them, they, uh, Vangelis, uh, 
Mark Garson, you know, all, all of those weird electronic stuff. And of course, you know, Hawkman, Pink Floyd, yes, that type of stuff was Gentle Giant, King Grimson, lots of experimental stuff. So, you know, the, the influencers are, are a huge, wide range of stuff. And I, I have quite a classical influence anyway on myself. And I think that seems to have seeped into to, uh, Mr. Hellwell as well. So, uh, uh, Mr. Hellwell as well. Uh, <laughs> I was just of, thinking oh, of that. That's a lot of wells. Yeah. Well, um, we can't fill too well in the crypt, remember? No, oh, that's right. It must be despairing. <laughs> um, you know, well, and that's one thing that I love about Hellwell is that, you know, we can just be as brutal as we want. We don't have to care. It's all for entertainment. It's all for, you know, it's, it's all grindhouse in a sense, you know. It's just as hardcore as possible, you know, and still be sounding like we're literate. <laughs> you know? And uh, I love writing that kind of lyric content. And it's just really a lot of fun for me. It's, you know, it, it's like, it's, it's like me getting a chance to, well, if I was in the pop stream it'd probably be like me writing like Weird Al Yankovic or something like that. Uh, but I just love it. I'm a huge fan of, of gore and, and adventure fantasy and, and, uh, um, you know, I'm, I, I like the stuff that Ernie writes about. I love Robert E. Howard, H.P. Lovecraft, Clyde Barker, you know. Tons of that type of stuff is just right up my alley. And, you know, when I, if I have time to watch TV, I don't even, you know, the only things I watch on Netflix, or I don't have regular TV as far as cable. I don't even go for that commercial crap anymore. I, I'll dial into movies pretty much only, and... I have like Rokro uh, internet streaming stuff, and I found all these great Grindhouse channels. One's even called the Grindhouse Channel. It's really good. And stuff like B Movie TV. And, and so I watch all these things that are just totally wicked ass old shit, you know, like Mad Doctor, Blood Island, and stuff like that, or Blood Beast, and Beast of Blood, blah, blah, blah. You know, <laughs> I love those types of movies. <clears throat> and so being in Hellwell gives me a chance to sort of unleash all of that stuff that I have pent up inside of me. And, uh, I don't have to worry about being morally correct about anything. It's just, it's all about everybody dies at the end and no happy endings. You know, it's really despairing. <laughs> so, yeah, I know that the bound, the beat, a little, little, little. Okay, edit that part out. Okay, we're going to edit that out. That's how, that's, you know, that just reminded me. You did that, and I immediately went to, I, I can't remember if it was In Like Flint or Air Man Flint, but James Coburn talking to the porpoise in one of those old movies going, <laughs> it was great. I was like, wait a minute, that didn't even sound like a porpoise, but it was funny. I, I mean, yeah, I didn't watch one of those movies. Take two, take two. <laughs> so, uh, with your Beyond the Boundaries of Sin, it came along with the storytelling booklet. So, you know, are you planning on doing another story for the new album? Uh, well, there's another story, but I think it's going to come out in EC's uh, uh, horror book. He's uh, he's putting together, uh, well, he just had a, a story, like I said, released in Swords of Steel 2. And it's not a horror story. It's actually more like a Conan or a King Cole type story. It's really, you know, more of an adventure sword play type of thing. Really, really action packed and lots of heads getting chopped and stuff like that. And it's a good story though. And, uh, but he's also been, uh, uh, doing lots of, of revamping of some of the old stories he wrote back in high school, like uh, one that I had based a song off of, Cage of Mirrors. He's revamped it completely. Uh, of course, uh, The Riddle Master came out in the first uh, Swords of Steel book uh, about a year or so ago, and that was uh, uh, the story that I based the song The Riddle Master on, on our Crystal Logic album. And, uh, uh, 
so and I think that's going to appear in the book too as well maybe but uh also Acronomicon which is the the story you're talking about that was released with uh, Beyond the Boundaries of Sin uh he's got that and he's got this other story the Last Rites of Edward Hawthorne which is uh really cool because he sort of took one of my ideas I had written a song called Rites of Blood on a Round of the Abyss album back in 1988 and he always liked that storyline that I'd come up with and he decided that uh he wanted to sort of work with that story idea and expand it and uh <clears throat> so uh we sort of colluded on that and he'd come up with this idea for an extended storyline on it and uh I don't think he's finished with that story yet but he's writing it right now but we worked together and came up with the lyrics for it uh, right away and the the songs already recorded and we had the outline to the story and everything and and so now and that's sort of a, a a bonus for me because it's something that I actually came up with the idea with first you know back in 88 and now it's sort of progressing into the story instead of like the old times where a story gets written and then I base a song off of the story <laughs> so it's sort of the opposite way around this time it's sort of cool but uh um uh, yeah I think he's uh he's working on that and maybe some other stories for uh it's going to be like oh you know like Clive Barker was always putting out the books of blood series you know which were just a whole bunch of different short stories um uh, in one book and I think that's what this is going to be and uh so uh you know I, I to tell you the truth I, I forgot exactly what the question was my dear <laughs> I'm just rambling on like usual like a like a like an opiated nut you know no worries oh no I was just asking if EC plans on writing one for the next album oh yeah for yeah. well in a sense yes because uh uh because there's a story there's a song in there that is related to a story but it's not going to be published in the album like we did the first one uh there was sort of a special one time thing because uh um uh, you know it was it was really a special event you know getting that band together and having that recording done and uh and at that time uh uh he hadn't been published you know anywhere and so it was i think it was sort of what in a sense gave him a start and gave him his idea that he could go ahead and publish stuff and since he's had a couple of stories published by DMR books and uh uh you know he's got big plans in the future for uh for more stories and he's he's working on a novel as well so and i think i think the novel is based on the same world that he's got and the same characters that he's got going on in the new uh swords of steel book so uh, uh no short story in the next album but um uh, definitely uh you know lots to expect from EC on the writing side of things cuz when he's not playing in our studio I don't think he does anything else except hide out and just you know write so nice <clears throat> I was noticing on the metal archives that for Hellwell your genre is considered heavy prog doom metal. So this is kind of like a personal question that I have. But I've noticed that a lot of like old 70s prog rock sounds just like doom. So I was just sort of wondering what yeah. what really that means like prog doom like what is that? Well, you know, I'm you know, I'm not the one that actually put that up there, so that's somebody else's, you know, analogy of what genres or genre or genres that we're in. Uh, you know, Hellwell's no not much more different than than Manila Road in the sense that we're willing to entertain any style of music and try and fuse it into heavy. And uh if you ask me I if you ask me the first doom type music that there ever was was like Wagner back in the classical days you know with the ring cycle cycle and Cotter Tamarung and stuff like that Johann Sebastian Bach and uh 
the Takata and Fugue and D minor, and you know, it's the thing, the thing they use for the theme and Rollerball and the Phantom of the Opera and stuff like that. I mean, that's really evil sounding frickin' doom type stuff to me. But as far as doom and rock, you know, obviously you've got to point at Black Sabbath for that because holy hell, how can you, you know, either that or Blue Cheer maybe, but how can you look beyond anybody else besides Sabbath when it comes to really evil sounding doom, dark type powerful metal or not metal but just rock period or music and uh so i, I really think you know uh you know since tony yomi and sabbath came up with the interval bar chord you know uh it's it's been the primary source of the sound of doom for anybody that's you know you know got any doom laden type riffs within their music um uh, we don't just latch on to one genre and stick with it. You know, like we're not just only thrash metal, but yet we'll have thrash metal ingredients every once in a while in our stuff. Uh, we're not just doom metal either, because but we do have doom metal, you know, ingredients in our music. But And I think that's why you see somebody putting so many genre titles underneath us there. What, what did you say it was? Um, it was heavy, I, prog do metal yeah and see you you can tell right away that i had nothing to do with that because i would have had to throw epic in there yeah. <laughs> epic <master. laughs> because because yeah i mean you know this stuff's definitely epic uh even the hellwall stuff is really epic i love long drawn out stuff that's you know presented in more of a a classical you know type approach and where you have movements and sections and stuff and uh and then eventually you know you have the variations of the theme you know the main theme and stuff like that. i just i love shit like that and it's uh not something that you get normally with most metal bands especially new age metal bands because it's all pretty much just you know cut and dry um uh, I've seen just so many bands. I, I mean, there's a lot of great bands out there, but there's also a lot of bands that just grab onto one one approach, and that's all they do. And I'm not going to name names, uh, but uh, you know, I get I get tired, I get bored of that, and uh, I like things to you know go places and see different atmospheric textures within the song, and not necessarily just always one direction, and uh, so uh, I think that's maybe, you know, why you see so many different monikers or genres, because it's probably pretty hard to just, you know, I, you can't look at Hellwell and just say, oh, yeah, they're doom metal, because at times we are pretty thrashy, and at other times we're really progressive sounding. And uh, But, uh, you know, one thing that I don't hear a lot of is that that, that old approach of, you know, Deep Purple, uh, Uriah Heep type stuff where it's, you know, really heavy keyboard, evil sounding keyboard things mixed in with with the band. And, you know, Rainbow was sort of like that too, and Dio would be, the, be that way at times. And uh, uh, I sort of miss that. And uh, uh, the one thing that I have noticed lately in seeing a lot of bands live is there sure are a lot of new age bands out there that have keyboard players that don't exist on stage. It's really weird. <laughs> so maybe we can do that with Ernie, you know, we'll just record, you know, have all of his parts pre-programmed and we'll, you know, get a, you know, maybe a cut, a life-size cutout, paper cutout and stand it up by, you know, up on stage somewhere. And <laughs> I, 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 will, I, will, I will name a, a band's name because I saw Lacuna Coil on the 70,000 tons of metal that we played at. I really like looking the coil, but I was surprised. I, I was like, wow, I hear keyboards all over the place, but I don't see a keyboard player. Where's the keyboard player? You know, and so, uh, and I realized that, there, you know, after seeing a lot of more new age type metal bands nowadays, there's evidently an awful lot of that going on uh, where you've got pre-recorded stuff and even, even drums that are pre-recorded or, or done by machines at the show, you know, and uh, 
like Samael was like that. Their drummer actually plays keyboards now, and he has a few drums set up beside him, but uh, almost all the drums were pre-programmed, and, and, uh, and it's, sort of, it's sort of weird. I'm used to seeing, you know, bands that have musicians playing and not... It, it's it's like even metal is becoming more and more like hip hop in the sense of things being pre-programmed and not necessarily musicians all over the stage. Uh, but that's one thing I don't understand about rap and hip hop is you got one guy and maybe two dancer chicks behind him, huge light show like Kiss is playing on a huge stage, and you got one guy out there rapping, and I don't know, I don't get it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I don't get it I I think that's poetry that's like street poetry and not necessarily music and I like seeing you know musicians play their parts live that's what that's what make it makes it interesting to me like like Deaf Mouse is you know does nothing for me because I know all that stuff's already pre-recorded yeah he he's a, a great electronic wizard and he recorded all that stuff but when he does his live shows, you know, he's just wearing that weird Mickey Mouse head and moving around and, you know, dancing. But he's not really playing. <laughs> <laughs> like a but, Britney Spears stand-up. Yeah, there you go. Well, you know, back in the day, like uh, when Manelli Vanelli or whatever they were was around, you know, if you lip synced, you got roasted for it. And then... You felt so bad you committed suicide. <laughs> and, and, and nowadays, it's like the norm. It's like what everybody does, even in live shows, you know. And, uh, and I, yeah, it's, I'm sorry it's not for me. I'm glad I don't lip seek. I'm glad I'm not doing that stuff. And it might be part of why we haven't ever done a video, although we're talking about doing some videos now because we're coming up on the 40th anniversary of... Uh, no road next year congratulations yeah. thanks that's uh yeah i'm surprised i even lived this long to tell you the truth <laughs> <laughs> way i used to party back in the old days it's uh it's a wonder i'm still around but uh <laughs> so uh so yeah yeah i'm I'm trying. I'm trying to think of something evil to say here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, actually, excuse me for a quick minute. I'm gonna sure. mute my microphone really quick. Okay. Hold on. Let's see. If your microphone is muted, but maybe mine is not muted. So that maybe maybe I'm still talking and you're still recording me. So instead of dead space, I could talk about stuff like really cosmic stuff. Like if you fold space, you know, does that mean when it snaps back after you jump from one to the other, you know, everything's is like a paradox shift. Hmm. I have to call the university and find it. Oh, I know. Let's call that Sheldon dude on the TV program. Yeah. I'm back. back. You're back. <laughs> I was just sitting here babbling on. I didn't know if it was still recording or not. Oh, no worries. I won't include that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can't if you want it. was weird. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, for my next question, I want to know how the guitar style between Manila Road and Hellwell is similar, but also completely different. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, as long as it's me playing guitar, there's always going to be a little bit of that me sound in there, no matter what, I think. But uh, <clears throat> with Hellwell, uh, I don't know. I, I try and go for this little bit more of a chaotic style, a little bit more of a chaotic approach instead of the real super fluent. Uh, yeah, I, I'd say Michael Shanker's more like Mike, or uh, Manila Road's more like Michael Shanker. And 
uh, Hell Wells, more like maybe like Tony Yomi or something like that, you know, where it's a little bit more abrasive. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I think at first I was trying to maybe do uh, maybe more speedier, more uh, shredding type guitar playing on the Hellwell, but can't say that's really true anymore because uh, some of the stuff I did on the Blessed Curse and the stuff that I've done on this new one that we're working on is uh, maybe even a little bit more shredding than what I do on Hellwell at times, but uh, uh, I've gone for this really sort of crying, alien, screaming type guitar thing <laughs> nice. with, with Hellwell. And, uh, I don't know, I just, uh, uh, I really, I like, I, it gives me a chance to be really aggressive and, and, and maybe in some ways a little bit more towards progressive playing, uh, because, you know, I can play some really oddball stuff that's not necessarily, uh, uh, in theoretically correct musical, you know, phrasings, but, uh. Uh, I've always had this idea if it sounds cool it's cool <laughs> and uh, especially if it's you know with Hellwell anything that's like a really wicked evil sounding you know core or, or demented riff that's uh, definitely the direction I'm going to go with mm -hmm. uh, with Manila Road I tend to try and look for more majestic sounding guitar structures I think so I'd, I'd say that's probably the the biggest di difference in approach guitar wise for me between the two bands is that Hellwell's more of a you know unabridged approach of just you know really trying to wail and scream and and uh, be as oddball as I want to be and then you know Rhodes more of towards the majestically correct sounding stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Hellwell was sort of like a, a chance for me to split off from Manila Road and not necessarily I was always torn with Manila Road as some of our albums really show where you know sometimes I was going for this really brutal approach to music like you know with uh, you can hear it in albums like uh, uh, Mystification Out of the Abyss you know where there was this, this more you know really dark and almost humor-esque grindhouse type approach to some things um, you can really really tell it on the Out of the Abyss album with songs like White Chapel and uh, Call Black Cauldron and Slaughterhouse and you know stuff like that it's definitely you know more like Hellwell music and uh, <clears throat> the, the coming of the band Hellwell gave me a chance to have more of an outlet for that stuff and let Mill Road be, be more of that majestic type, uh, you know, uh, be more of that majestic type of band that, uh, sorry, my, my son was coming in to bother me and I, I shoot him away. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he was looking way too happy to be in here, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Okay, now C got me off the train of thought again. Now, now I'm slipping back into my opiated state. <laughs> no, it's perfectly fine. Because actually, my next question sort of uh, meshes with uh, what you were saying. Um, because there is that sort of crypt vibe that comes off in mystification. You know, haunted palace, spirits of the dead, up from the crypt. And also the courts of chaos. Dig me no grave, a touch of madness. Yep. So it seems like that sort of crypt essence sort of just rattles in your bones. It does. It does. I love stuff like that. You know, if, if, I, if, if I could, if I could find a place that would work with me on it, I'd have an office in like a, you know, like a, a crypt, you know, in some graveyard somewhere. If they could let me set up my, my office and <laughs> like a mausoleum, that'd be great. I'd love it. And uh, <clears throat> you can get so much done when you're, you know, sitting amongst the dead. They, 
really just don't bother you very much. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they do. <laughs> well, yeah, if you, if you bother them. <laughs> That's true. But, uh, no, I, 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 you know, I've always had this, uh, uh, this deep-seated lust, you might say, for uh, really good horror and dark and, and abysmal type you know, atmospheric things, and uh, the crypt is definitely a good place to be if you like that type of stuff, and I do. And uh, so, you know, my studios uh, in my basement, is, as you know, you've been there, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's like my little crypt. It's my little vault away from the world, you know, and uh, the dungeon. And then, yeah, the dungeon, and then, you know, and if, if if I party enough, then it becomes my spaceship, you know, <laughs> when, I, when I'm sitting behind the control board and everything, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm piloting my ship. No, I, I you know, I've, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a graveyard not too far away from my house, uh, and uh, when we were kids, we used to sneak into it all the time and just hang out amongst the old Civil War crypts and uh, love those things. As a matter of fact, the uh, the picture on the back of the, the Deluge album, the original release, had a, a picture of the three of us looking down through this broken out window thing. That's actually the top of one of those Civil War crypts. And uh, the photographer was in the middle of the crypt inside looking up and we were on top of it looking down mm. yeah so yeah that type of stuff you know totally is where i like to go with the hellwell atmosphere of course being a, a huge edgar Allan poe and robert e howard and hp lovecraft fan it just all ties in together it's just so so it's so bloody cool. I just love a it, girl. It's so bloody cool. I love grindhouse type stuff. I love, you know, I love the fight against good and evil. It just, it's so heroic. It's great. <laughs> nice. So, any last thoughts on doom metal? Because I know you're epic metal extraordinaire. Doom metal. Well, uh, you know, I'm friends with Lee Fedling, and uh, I'd like to throw out all my best to him because I know he's struggling with some uh, physical ailments right now. And so, uh, send him some positive energy out there, gang. Uh, he needs some healing energy from all of you. Much love from the crypt. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, that guy's remarkable. He, he writes some of the most. Uh, exquisite doom riffs and uh, I, I'm just really really proud of what he's done with doom metal and if somebody really needed a, a you know an example of, an, of, of what doom metal is um, just almost any candle mass album would be a good place to start although I would think that Epicus Dimicus Metallicus you know it's always it's sort of like people always think Crystallogic is the best we've ever done. I, I don't necessarily think Epicus is the best that Candlemoss did, but it's definitely a classic album, and definitely has that, that that typical, you know, what I would call a typical doom atmosphere to it, and uh, lyrically and and musically, it, it's it's a good example of what I think doom metal is. But I think the true roots of doom obviously come from Black Sabbath. You know, really heavy bands like that uh, even though at the time they weren't calling themselves metal and let's face it uh, you know genre names are just I, I don't know if they're really even necessary that much I mean they are to an extent but you know the fact is is we all play music and some of us play louder and heavier and faster than others and some of us play slower I mean uh, there's this band called Conan that's evidently, uh, you know, uh, considered a doom metal band. And I think the only reason they're considered doom metal is because they only play one note every 32 measures, you know. <laughs> and uh, 
I actually sort of like them, though. It's really weird. Because, yeah, uh, I, I actually got to see them at Psycho California, and oh, it I've was... Never seen them, I've never seen them live, but I've, I've seen some of their videos. Are, are they good live? Yeah, actually, that sort of a strumming, droning riff somehow uh-huh. puts the whole entire audience in the state of hypnosis. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's what it's all about, is the magic of the circle anyway, so... But yeah, you know, if... I know exactly what you mean, though. Yeah, if you if uh, it it's weird that you know I mean you've got that kind of uh, that's like the slowest <laughs> the slowest doom I have ever heard in my life. I'm not sure you could get any slower than that, and uh, uh, it's it, you know I think I think there's so many different ideas from people of what doom is, but it's because like I I'm more towards the old sort of sabbath doom sound you know or and, and like you were saying there's so many bands from old like deep purple or right heap you know other other bands from back then blue cheer that that their heavy slow stuff really has that sound of doom and of course i think that's really sort of where the idea of doom what modern day doom came from anyway and uh uh so you know, I'm not surprised that people are, are are sounding a little bit like that because I think that's what inspired the the doom type sound anyway. I mean, well, look at the band Orchid. You know, they're considered doom metal, but they sound almost exactly like Black Sabbath in many ways. Even the lead singer sounds quite a bit like Ozzy at times. And um, good band. I've seen them live, and they're really good. And uh, but at the same time, you know, I'm, uh, that's not what Black Sabbath called themselves. They didn't call themselves doom metal back in the day when they wrote all that stuff that has influenced these doom metal bands. You've got them calling themselves hard rock back then, basically, and that was it. And same way with uh, with Deep Purple, even though they were doing songs that in some terms, you know, later on in the the 80s and would have been considered thrash metal you know like uh the song speed king definitely more of a you know speed metal type of, of song but yet they were just they just considered themselves hard rock nobody had really coined the metal phrase that much yet and uh, uh so you know it, it's all a matter of just interpretation i think personal interpretation and I, I suppose it depends on what era you're living in as well, because obviously uh, uh, the media is going to be commanded by the newer generations of people coming through uh, and and being the reviewers and the interviewers and stuff like that. So uh, unless you've got people that are just doing that all their life, you most likely you've got a new breed of journalists or uh, reviewers critiques whatever you want to call them coming through all the time so obviously the expectations are going to change and and you know what i grew up with here in kansas is probably a lot different than what somebody of my own age grew up with in new york city or or in paris or in germany or something like that <clears throat> so a lot of it's your environment a lot of it's what you have around you and what you're you know, uh, what you're made aware of, in a sense. And uh, uh, personally, I think there's too many genres out there. I, I can't keep track of them all anymore. It's despairing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. I, I kind of feel like um, that's why I've started the Crypt of Despair, to sort of uh, bring that old essence from antiquity that sort of, uh, you know, like you were saying, Hanging out in the mausoleum sort of vibe. That whole okay. Transylvanian castle. I mean, I've, I just... That's what I sort of expect whenever I think of Doom. Yeah, definitely. And, and of course, a despairing outlook in some way or form. <laughs> yeah. No, I... Uh, <clears throat> I agree with you completely. I, I, I think... Uh, and I, th- I think there is actually a trend back to uh, the discovery of the older older styles. I've seen it in a lot of young people nowadays, uh, maybe more so in Europe, 
but uh, I'm starting to see it here in America as well. And uh, when we were on our last tour here in the States on the West Coast, it was uh, it was really nice to see an awful lot of uh, new breeds of metalheads that were actually, uh, you know, researching and delving into uh, music that they uh, really didn't grow up with and weren't ever, you know, introduced to through the media because that time had been long gone unless they accidentally, you know, happened upon a, a classic rock station or something that was playing, you know, something heavier than normal, heavier than Bachman Turner Overdrive. You know. And, uh, <clears throat> but I see a lot of young kids discovering bands like Sabbath and, and Zeppelin and, and Purple, Hendrix and stuff like that for the first time. And, uh, and they're they're just totally blown away by the stuff, which is is really cool. <laughs> and to see people, you know, you know, actually taking the time to to investigate some of the the older styles of music, and and you know, somebody that's as old as I am saw all the evolutions that went on to lead us to where we are today. And the the young kids of today, they don't see that evolution they have to actually you know inquire and open their minds and study a little bit and and find out how you know the progression from say like you know blues and jazz into rock and roll into hard rock into heavy metal happened and then there's been this huge evolution from the start of heavy metal up until now as, as well and i think that evolution is going to continue i mean it's the same thing with other styles of music, too, or not all styles, but a lot of them. For example, country music, you know, it's had this really weird evolution where now it's not really, you know, the, the mainstream of country music, to me, isn't even country music anymore. It's like pop rock with a country flavor to it. <laughs> <laughs> French style. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, pop style country music, and and you know, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's 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 a weird evolution, and and all musics, uh, all styles of music, evidently have this evolutionary trend, and you know, it doesn't always necessarily end up where you think it's going to. Or, uh, and I guess it's usually money driven. I would think. I mean, most of the most of the reasons that uh, the media jumps on board of anything is because it's selling or it's drawing an awful lot of. Mm -hmm. Attention, and uh, so uh, you know, I I still think that you know the the really creative artistic side of the music industry and the metal industry is uh, is still sort of an underground flow of people. You know, uh, it's people like you and me, and you know, other bands that you know I'm really proud to be friends with, like Candle Moss and. Raven, Jag Panzer, you know, bands like that, that, you know, we've been around for a long time and we, uh, we're still battering out, you know, our styles of what we consider, you know, our own evolution of music. And, uh, uh, but it's cool to see that we've got, you know, we've got new, new young people that are metalheads that are in front of us at audiences. And, uh, they actually know our material and that's totally amazing to me because uh that means that they're they're taking the time to discover and that's something that i think i, I wish every metalhead had the experience of that i grew up with which was going to the local record store and you know flipping through all the new albums and everything and the and flipping through the import section and stuff like that you don't have that experience going on for anybody anymore unless, you know, you, you go to a vinyl shop. I mean, they're coming back a little bit, but it's still not the same as it was because you don't have everybody paying attention to the vinyl just yet. And so you don't have everything coming out new, brand new on vinyl just right away. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I wish some of those new metalheads could have, you know, experienced what I went through in the old days where you didn't have the internet to, to guide you to a hundred thousand different bands that 90,000 of them sound like shit. And, 
then you have to, you know, muddle your way through to find somebody that sounds good. It used to be totally different. You'd go to the record store and you'd be, you know, on a journey and a quest to find what you might like. And usually what you were going by was the name of the band, uh, the caliber of the artwork, and not only that, but the song titles, you know, what the song titles sounded like to you. And that's how I chose albums back in the day. It wasn't because you had the chance to hear it beforehand that much. Uh, not if you were looking for something new, uh, so, you know, I'd take a chance. I'd find an album that had, oh, the band name sounds cool. It's a cool looking cover. And let's see the song titles. Oh, yeah. Grind your bones into the earth. I think I might like that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, and that's how I'd pick albums back then. And sometimes you'd score and sometimes you'd be like, all right, that's a Frisbee. And, <laughs> uh, but, you know, nobody gets that experience anymore, really. Uh, not unless you, really set out to just only go to the vinyl store and disconnect your disconnect yourself from the internet. Mm -hmm. But now it's all you have to do is go to YouTube and everybody's on there. Everything's on YouTube. So, and it's for free. So most of us don't get paid anymore. <laughs> I know we're having a juggle out here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's interesting. You know, the internet's a two handed sword. It's uh it's been extremely helpful uh, when it comes to my career. It's been extremely helpful. I'm, you know, more wide, widely known around the world than ever before. And I think a lot of that is due to the internet. Uh, but at the same time, you know, all across the board, not just with Manila Road or just with metal, but with every, uh, every type of music, that there is out there actual physical sales of CDs and, uh, and vinyl is really way down. And it's because everybody's getting their stuff. You know, they, I don't even think there's a lot of people I know that don't even buy stuff anymore. They just listen to their stuff on Pandora or Spotify or all these other places that you can go. And, uh, so, you know, and everybody's listening to it on their phones and, and nobody sits at home and has, I, I haven't seen very many people nowadays with the big stereo in their living room, like, like we all used to have. It's more like, oh yeah, well. The Marshall cabinets just right there in the dining room. Well, I, yeah, I, I love Marshall cabinets. I've got several of them, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I love Marshalls too. I, yeah. I have one of their new amplifiers, actually. And it's, really? Yeah, it's so strange because uh, it's actually like Bluetooth, so you could connect yeah. your cell phone to the actual end. Goodness, Marshall makes a cell phone amplifier now. Yeah. <laughs> see, see, even Marshall has joined the new league of, of Skynet or whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, See, we should all despair because Skynet is coming. I, you know, it may not be called Skynet, but it's coming. AI. Skynet. Make... They're the aliens. <laughs> uh, it's just, uh, it's just artificial intelligence. That's what we got to worry about. Aliens ain't gonna get us. Aliens don't care. They're, they're, <laughs> they got other shit that they're worried about right now. It's, and besides, they they look at the Earth and they say, oh no, it's going to be a burnt cinder in five hundred thousand years anyway. Leave them alone. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, yeah, no, no aliens. Because <laughs> <laughs> if 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 you talk aliens, you're going to start talking about probes, and we ain't going there. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't want to hear about any of those. Mad scientists. Oh, yeah, we do. <laughs> We're in the crypt of despair. We've got to hear about shit like that. Come on. <laughs> Thank you for sticking around, my friends. Until next time, keep your eyes peeled for the new Hellwell release. And don't die on me now.